Okay, welcome to the Danger Zone. That is my workbench. So today we have a good old Pratt 29 and a half jewelry or polishing lathe. Depending on uh, what kind of documentation you look up, it's probably from, I'm going to say, the late 1920s. Um, after 1931, Goodell Pratt was sold to um, Miller's Falls, and it's potential that this was still made by Miller's Falls at the time, but uh, I cannot confirm that, just based on, on the way it looks. So, uh, you just saw me remove the old leather belt, so this is a treadle lathe. Um, or at least treadle compatible, meaning that you could power it by foot, but you couldn't power it from below like the old sewing machines. You had to actually power it uh, with a counter shaft behind it. All right, I'm trying to get this chuck off. Now the chuck is, is somewhat damaged. It's mainly the threaded portion, as you see me take it off now. That's kind of damaged, um, and the ring that adjusts the jaws in and out is also fairly worn out. Uh, it's seen some heavy use, apparently. But the actual shaft itself um, didn't really seem like it was worn out anywhere. I thought just being steel, a shaft on a cast iron bearing uh, would have worn out. But I guess the previous owner or owners uh, kept it lubed and oiled enough that there wasn't really any slop whatsoever which is fantastic because uh, otherwise I'd have to drill out and, and put uh, new bronze bushings in there which is not the case unlike the previous video for the power hammer. Now even getting this out wasn't crazy crazy difficult I didn't need a puller or anything like that I just hit it with some penetrating oil uh, and just twisted it back and forth until I could pull it right out. Now the actual pulley on here, uh, you can see the groove is where the treadle leather cord would go, or leather uh, belt would go, and then right beside it, the thinner diameter part of the pulley, is where a small leather or whatever flat belt could go. It's about three quarters of an inch wide. Uh, the tailstock here was... Uh, interesting in that it doesn't seem to necessarily match what I have found online for a 29 and a half uh, lathe. So I'm not exactly sure if this lathe was pieced together, kind of like a Franken lathe of parts from other good L. Pratt lathes, because they did make uh, many different models of lathes back in the day. I don't know. Uh, we will never know. Regardless, uh, I did have a difficult time trying to get this nut off the top of uh, the little wheel on the adjustment of the tailstock. But um, I took it to the vise to try to give it a little more grip uh, using the fancy new mini 3-inch wrenches. Um, but it, it didn't really work, uh, although I did get the main tailstock housing off. The little brass... Um, screw and nut as I'm taking off right here is uh, not really original to a 29 and a half inch or sorry a 29 and a half model lathe it's it's original to an older and larger good L. Pratt lathe so it's it's kind of more evidence that leads to the possibility that this was pieced together from from another another good L. Pratt lathe I, I tried a few methods. I didn't really want to mar or bend or break anything, so I, I'm being fairly gentle. But uh, I just decided to kind of wait until after all the rust has been removed to to go more aggressive on, on getting that nut off. This is just the, the little tool rest. Uh, it's kind of poorly designed because it's just screwed together and it can unscrew when you're using it. Um, but this lathe was not for, you know, large and accurate uh, turning. It's just more for, for simple light duty use. Here you get a closer look at the chuck uh, and the damage associated with it. Uh, you can see the chunks kind of missing out of that back plate there. I don't know how this, this wasn't really hard. 
Uh, it wasn't hardened steel on that back piece, so I don't know how the chunks were gone. It doesn't look like it was bent or dented. It just looks like they're broken off for some reason. So that's very odd. The same with the ring roller. There, there are holes. The holes that aren't the, the kind of big holes, not the ones that are nice and circular, the slot holes, are not original. I have no idea why they're there or what they even do. They might have been uh, drilled in there for kind of those locking wrenches that you can use to tighten chucks. Otherwise, I have no idea uh, why they're there. And I'm really just trying to figure out how to get this thing apart. Uh, I have no idea. There, there's no other instruction online, obviously. No other documentation from anyone else taking it apart. So I'm just trying everything, seeing if I can tap it out, if I can spin it out, if I can do anything. Um, hitting it with oil, hitting it with heat. And uh, in the end, it's, it's just not coming apart. And I don't want to risk doing aggressive damage. Uh, trying to get it off. So I might as well put it in the rust remover and get back to it after that because then I know it's not the rust that's stopping it from coming apart. The brass tags are always a very slow and delicate process. You, you really don't want to rush through this. You just need to, at least in my case, for this one, go with a tiny razor blade and um, slowly try to pry it up. These are just nails that are, are that are tapped into drilled holes in the casting uh, so they're not going to screw out or anything but um, just popping them out is is really the only way you can get access to it i'm also interested in getting this off because i don't i, I don't know if this paint is original i haven't seen any other good old pratt um, lathes with a, a gray base very odd so just having looking under here is, is kind of interesting i decided to cut slots in these domed nails uh, that allows me at least to break it free of whatever's holding it in and i was lucky that this actually worked and didn't strip the brass before uh, i got it out otherwise i'd have to grind them right off uh, and cut them right off and then pop it out so i'm just kind of twisting this back and forth to get the penetrating oil in there and then I should be able to just pop it off. Now it does look like it's gray underneath so I'm not sure if it's been repainted or not or it could have been repainted and someone did exactly what I'm doing now and just took the tag off. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, it's just kind of odd to see a, a lathe that looks like this. Maybe this was really late in production. Uh, all the online documents say it should be black and vermilion, which is a red-orange that I'm seeing here. Another tell that this may have been repainted is checking for lead. These all should have lead in their paint, um, both the gray and the red. And it really apparently seems that there is no lead paint in the gray portion, which seems odd to me, considering this would be at latest the... 1931 um, the red paint seemed to have lead based on what I'm used to seeing but the paint was also red and the lead tester turns red so it's not the most helpful uh, it could have contained lead it could not have I, I'm not 100% sure so I just treat it like it does even if I didn't treat it so nicely um, I'm not going to die from maximum lead exposure. There's very little lead in the paint anyways. It does come off fairly easy on the gray paint too, which is another sign that it's it's just a different, potentially later type of paint. The earlier paints are just harder to get off. I don't know why, it's just more durable for some reason. So all of them are just going to go into the sensual evaporest, which is my favorite part of every single video because it's just so satisfying to have science do the work for me uh, instead of, you know, me having a sandblast and get all disgusting. And it's just nice to put it in, wait a few hours and take it out of the giant tub that I now have, which is also fantastic. I haven't even filled it up yet. Um, I maybe i should but if if i start doing some really really big stuff in the future i'll have to fill it up 
Just because uh, I need I need everything and anything removed off of it. So now that they have been completely cleared of rust, I can actually see that the chuck has numbers and letters on it. Um, each each uh, chuck segment seems to be numbered corresponding to the jaws, so I can put them right back where they belong. And it also says the tool manufacturer on the face. I had an epiphany and thought, hey, let's try to spin this, see if it moves. And it totally just popped right off, uh, which was super easy and made me realize that this piece right here is probably probably meant to spin off, much like a, a chainsaw clutch. And I'm using a camshaft holding tool that I've modified to fit in the holes uh, on this specific lathe chuck. Uh, and it still wasn't coming off, so I just tried to tap the threads, which can loosen up uh, some stuff if there's just a little bit stuck. You never know. It doesn't really hurt, but uh, it can help. And finally, it just pops, and I just start twisting back and forth. I wasn't sure which way this was threaded, uh, so I was just kind of twisting one way and the other way and hoping it pops, and eventually did. I was happy to see that there wasn't really any slop in the chuck at all um, all the kind of surfaces that would normally be worn uh, weren't very worn so and not like they get high use it's just uh, it's just nice to see it saves me some time back to the tailstock adjuster here um, just giving it as much as I can and it finally just pops off uh, which is fantastic it makes my job way easier it, it almost might be easier just to throw the entire tool in evaporust and then come back to it uh, afterwards it, but uh, I like seeing before uh, what surfaces were painted and not painted uh, so I can get to it properly during the restoration process this also became very loose after soaking I, I don't really know why but um, it was super easy to get out versus tough to get out before so I just kind of unscrewed this. I, I won't be replacing this part because it's not original to a 29 and a half inch length, but I'll leave the threads uh, in the wheel in case, you know, the next owner wants to maybe even turn like a little brass handle on the lathe itself. 16 inch wire wheel on my new radial drill press. The radial drill, pre drill press kind of allows me to fit such a massive wheel on it and so far I like it I'm just kind of testing out the idea if it's even something that's worth it here I'm just cleaning this up on the belt sander it doesn't really need to be very accurate at all it just needs to uh, have a nice flat edge for you to reference off of when you're turning whatever you happen to be turning So I'm going to do my usual paint process on these, which is just uh, hit it with some self-etching primer and then uh, let that dry, sand it with like 300 grit and then go to the paint. Uh, I found this to be the closest color match uh, that was available. I could have had it actually color matched, um, but according to... Um, lots of documents and things that I read online, the kind of reddish color varied insanely um, throughout the time period that these were manufactured. And, and that basically goes for any any tool. That, nothing's consistent forever. Uh, so you just kind of go with what, what looks the, the closest to what you have in your hands at the time. So we needed to weld this up. Uh, fill all the holes, get it all cleaned up uh, so that we can return it and then re -knurl it and hopefully have a nice looking piece. The issue with that, as it turned out, and as you saw from the sparks here, is that this um, was hard even after annealing, even after just using a mild steel rod for welding. It was really weird. I'm not exactly sure what type of steel this was, but it definitely was something that can air harden. Um, regardless, 
the knurling on it still occurred. It just wasn't as good as I was hoping it could be, but uh, too bad. What can you do? That's life. Here we're using the CNC lathe, which we use to make the wrenches, uh, just to turn that, that damaged back piece or back plate uh, on the chuck. And this machine just makes it stupidly easy. And you just put in the measurements and you're good to go, for the most part. Um, it's not always that easy, but uh, it's nicer than, I guess, just doing it by hand. And the finish is fantastic because you have that just consistent feed rate all the time. It does have a lot of power also. You'll see it... Uh, Right now, take just a one-inch bore all at once, and it uh, doesn't really seem to care. This part came out fantastically. Uh, really, really nice. All the holes were just perfect, and it fit exquisitely into its original holder. I believe this mill is, or oh, the CNC lathe, sorry, is uh, like a mid 90s uh, lathe, and it, it's fairly basic in terms of CNC lathes, but obviously uh, it can do lots of fancy tricks. So now we're here at the CNC mill, uh, just drilling the holes. First, we're just gonna center drill them and then go for the big drill. Everything here. Um, I have to do without fluid, uh, coolant, or any type of oil, just for your viewing pleasure. But uh, it doesn't always <laughs> work out the best. Uh, we've ruined a lot of tooling that way, but that's the sacrifice I do for you people. It's just, it's just the way it is. So here is the new uh, ring. On the chuck, you can see the knurling there. Uh, it's not the end of the world, but it's just a little bit more inconsistent than uh, would be ideal, but uh, live with it. So there's the new back plate. Uh, I didn't mess with the fasteners. I generally don't mess with fasteners because it's just I don't want to in, in the sense that uh, I, I like the kind of use that they have. Um, but at the end of the day, I guess you could clean them up a little bit if you really wanted to. There's no need to polish them up to 12 bajillion grit uh, unless you really want to. It's just not what was original uh, if you were going for a original look restoration. There's a chuck all together and you saw all of the different numbering and, and how they match. So that was fantastic. And the thread's on just fine, and uh, I was glad to see that back together. So this is the new black base. Uh, I'm just going to hit it with my diamond stone to kind of see where the high and low spots are. Um, I'm, I'm not, essentially, I'm, I'm not massively concerned with this being perfectly flat to the point where I would hand scrape it or machine it flat. It doesn't need that at all. This is just a, an, an inaccurate uh, lathe and that was even marketed that way that it just doesn't need to be that. Uh, it has a specific job and that job is not high accuracy. Here I'm just removing the paint off that uh, sanded area that I did earlier. It's just way easier than trying to tape off this little tiny strip perfectly. You might as well just get a nice perfect edge with the sandpaper. So the chuck is going back on and the pulley's going back on and they're completely fine. There's no paint in the holes. As you saw earlier, I use, I just buy like a tub of, you know, 200 um, soft earplugs and I use those to plug different holes for threaded holes sometimes, sometimes not. But in this case, I just filled up all the holes with that. Much easier than taping and it seems to work better too. I generally don't... Um, put them in threaded areas unless I, I feel like it's necessary. 
just because a lot of these threads are all sloppy and loose after a hundred years so having a little paint in them just kind of makes it a little tighter so it it, it kind of is closer to the original feel but uh, sometimes I do feel them when when I'm trying to get uh, a different type of look so this is going on just fine it spins completely freely now it's really nice and smooth so I'm very happy with that uh, and getting this on uh, it seems to go on easy as well so that's totally acceptable in my book and makes the use of this thing uh, much simpler although it is still missing a little bit of a dead center uh, at the end of it um, but I will get to that a little bit later. So I decided to go with some um, just brass washers in between the uh, steel knobs and the steel casting of the main frame uh, just to give it a little bit of a barrier uh, I, I saw that it was painted and I was hesitant about painting over areas that get worn as that's kind of a general rule of mine I don't like painting wear areas as it's just is gonna come off anyways but uh, to stick to its original design I, I just decided to go with that so this little tool rest just threads on to a screw and that's what holds it in place. Uh, the only issue is that it moves off the top of that thread. Um, even with this fully clamped down, um, you can spin the red part, the red tool rest part separately from the cylinder that is in the hole that I'm trying to tighten to. Uh, it isn't exactly the best design in the world. Uh, but I don't think it, it mattered for this case as it wasn't the most accurate machine ever designed. This machine was fairly simple though in terms of the number of parts uh, and how it disassembles and goes back together. It was kind of nice for a change to just have something that almost entirely just screws together in you know five ten minutes and I, I don't have to spend seven hours trying to remember where everything went uh, it's fairly simple so i'm going to start making the dead center for in here i know it's supposed to have one i don't know the taper that is in there i thought it was a morris a morris zero uh, but i got one of those and it definitely didn't fit so i think it's just some weird custom taper at least it is tapered i'm using the highly highly accurate method of just turning one on the belt grinder and then uh, once I have a fit that, that I think works, I heated it up and put it into this case hardening powder. And that powder essentially just instantly makes a, an outer surface that is hard on mild steel. After you get it red hot, you dunk it in the powder, you let it kind of melt on there, and then you bring it back out and you bring it to red hot again, and then you quench it in water. Uh, it has to be water, the oil doesn't really cool it down enough to get that case hardening. And now it should be pretty hard on the outside to, to at least work for the function it was designed for. I got these uh, hardness files that are rated at different hardnesses. Uh, and you can kind of hear the difference in when it's hard and when it's soft. But these at least go from Rockwell 40 to 65 to kind of tell me where I'm at. And this one seemed to be uh, very hard at uh, somewhere over 60 but under 65. So it, it's right where it needs to be for, for this type of uh, lie, or sorry, dead center. And it fits in there nice and cozy. And I was just uh, made a little wedge thing that'll pop it out if I needed to. That's originally how you would get this type of pin out. But once you press it against whatever's in the chuck, it'll tighten up and, and be fine. This is how I redid the pins that were used to hold the tag. That's just, those were just two domed brass nails, uh, and those will work perfectly. And here I just brighten up the, the tag just a little with some very fine uh, quadruple zero steel wool. That's the stuff I use for all my brass plates. 
Um, it doesn't take the paint off. And it does give a little bit of a shine of the brass. I, I have a hard time shining brass up as it, it does really ruin. Uh, I think the, the collector value or the look, um, and I know I'm already technically quote unquote ruining it with a restoration according to some people, but in this case, I just kind of stick to what I like aesthetically and that's just not a super shiny brass. It doesn't seem to, I don't know, match. Uh, the kind of age of the tool that I'm hoping to get. I'm just oiling the shaft here. I use my standard um, 30 weight non-detergent oil uh, just in case the detergent does anything I don't like. Regardless, it seems to be powerful enough to totally get some fantastic chips off of brass even with this fairly dull lathe wood lathe chisel that I have and here's another one I'm trying different uh, chisels to see what I can do I'm just kind of messing around while I form you know, this whatever piece just to kind of show you that it is working and it is powerful enough although the belt did uh, slip off off there I must have not had it maximum tightness but what can you do just backing the tailstock off removing the piece from the chuck uh, and it was fairly centered like I didn't I didn't bother you know getting it perfectly centered but uh, that's the way it is and I think it turned out pretty great I'm hoping to do more kind of interesting stuff not with this lathe specifically but with more lathes that I have coming up in the future so this was kind of my first jump into that um, that area of restorations the bigger lathes obviously need more attention spent to getting things flat and square and, and perfect as that's what you need when you're turning something on a metal lathe specifically either way thank you all for watching and i will see you all in the next video